Shauna and her husband are a fourth generation farm and ranch family located near Scobie, Montana, where they raise wheat, lentils, pea, corn, barley, and hay, and also run a herd of 100 Black Angus cow-calf pairs. In addition to farming for the traditional commodity market, Shauna and her husband began a direct-to-consumer business called Farber Farms, LLC. They market a lentil cruncher ready-to-eat snack, lentil baking mixes, and lentil meal kits such as salads and soup mixes, um, as well as two wheat uh, meal mixes, which I'm just curious, has anyone in the room run into those products? I know I've seen lentil crunchers around. We've had them at some events. I've seen the soup mixes that cooks on main. Okay, awesome. So we do have people who've uh, run into Farber Farm products, Shauna. So wonderful. Um, and then just to wrap it up here, uh, Shauna is an advocate for agriculture in rural America and does speaking engagements, blogging, and fundraising activities. So thank you very much for joining us. I am Shauna Farber. I'm the president and founder of Farber Farms LLC, which is the commercial uh, production leg of our farming operation. And we do um, use the commodities that we grow, wheat and lentils, um, to make products, um, meal kits and baking mixes, and also lentil crunchers, snack products. And I had some pack to bring with me, and I feel bad that I wasn't able to get them there for you. Uh, so you can find them at Cooks on Main. You can also find them, I believe, at Glow Tanning um, Salon there in Williston. Um, or if you'd like to try, you can order online. And, and when we're done here, I'll set up a free, um, a free shipping link. Just use NDSU, and I'll set up, set up a free shipping link in case any of you would like to try um, and we'll include some extra goodies in your order since I, I wasn't able to bring them for you. So um, let's start a little bit with, with the history of, of how this whole thing started anyway. Um, we have a traditional farming operation, about a small operation, about 3,500 acres. Some of that deeded, some leased, and we run about 125 head of um, Black Angus uh, cow-calf pears. And that was fine. Um, and then our kids got a little older, they got into high school and started talking about um, how they wanted to come back to the farm when they graduated, which is fantastic. Um, I, I think a lot of farm families are in the same position and, and really hope that their kids will want to come back or they're in the position where they want them to run as far and as fast as they can. But we were happy to hear that our kids wanted to come back. And the question becomes then, how do you make that happen? So uh, what we had was supporting one family. Um, our son and our daughter both wanted to come back. So how, how do we make um, what we have support three families now, or at least partially support three families? We knew some on off farm income would have to be part of that, um, but really wanted to find a way to, to make that fit so that um, we could all be here together doing, doing the thing that we love doing. So, uh, you know, there's only so much land. Land is hard to come by. Um, land prices are challenging right now, even if there's something that does come up for sale. Uh, you can only grow so much on that land, uh, you know, obviously using all the techniques that we that we knew how to use or know how to use to maximize our uh, bushels per acre, uh, you know, rotational grazing so we can run the most amount of cows possible, but there's still only so much that you can do. And so we, we started brainstorming and thinking, um, you know, what, what else is there? You look, you know, you step out your front door or whatever it is and, and you look and, and think there must be something else that we can do to supplement here. Uh, so about the same time I went to a conference that's held here in Montana every year, Women Stepping Forward for Agriculture. It's a great conference and they have some fantastic speakers. And one of the speakers was, um, a woman who runs Elliott's of Montana, they do fundraising with cookie dough. And she talked about how they started from their home. Um, they originally used some products from their, their farm. They don't anymore, but that got me thinking. It sort of set the ball rolling. Uh, I'm, I'm actually um, a farm girl and I'm messing with my phone here, sorry. Um, Cause I keep getting messages. Uh, I, I'm actually a value added girl from way back. Uh, Montana used to have what was called the Montana Ag Innovation Center. And, and I worked uh, as a regional um, counselor in that capacity. So value added agriculture has kind of always been on my, ra my radar. Uh, we did some beef sales way back when the kids were just little and the internet was kind of just getting started. Um, so 
and I don't know if you're getting, are you getting those, sorry, those notifications that keep showing up on my phone? Are you seeing those? We're not, no. Oh, good. Okay. So I won't be distracted by them. <laughs> so um, we had talked about value-added things before, um, started talking again, what can we do? And we, and we really literally just sit down, sat down and we made a list on paper. What are our options? Do we want to sell beef by the cut again? Do we uh, want to look at agritourism? Do we want to look at um, opening, you know, getting some kind of dealership, farm dealership or something like that that would tie into what we're already doing? We went through a lot of really crazy things and, and put them all down on paper and talked about what the pros and cons were, um, what would fit, what wouldn't fit, what the investment would be. Um, we're located in a really remote area, um, a long ways from everywhere in SCOBY. I, I mean, our whole, our whole area is, you, I don't have to explain that to any of you, um, but SCOBY is really 45 miles from anywhere on roads that are uh, less than desirable. So, um, so that, was, that was part of it too. And that ruled out some things like um, shipping beef by the cut because we actually can't ship overnight or, or overnight into SCOBY. So, so that automatically ruled some things out. And um, we eventually came up with food. Food has always been on my radar as well. I had a German grandmother. And I remember when I was two, her pulling a stool up to the counter for me to, to stand on and watch as she would bake. And she'd tell me that um, we feed people, we feed them often and we feed them well. And um, so that's something that really stuck with me. Um, it's something that's always been kind of a, a heart thing for me. And um, Terry felt like he had his hands full uh, just farming and doing the farming part of it. And he said, well, let's, let's go with that then. So we, um, we developed a line of mixes that uses the wheat or the lentils um, just in their, in their raw form, in their seed form as they come out of the combine and they get cleaned and then they, um, and I'll show you some products here in a minute. They go in the bag with a seasoning packet um, and then they go on the shelf. So uh, we talk about it being almost like an adult hamburger helper kind of thing. Um, and so then you add meat or, or other things that um, people usually have in their kitchen add to those mixes. Um, to make a meal for their families. Incidentally, I was at a trade show one time uh, in Salt Lake, and I was talking about how we, um, we view this as sort of an adult hamburger helper. And one of the people that I was pitching to actually um, was involved with a company that makes hamburger helper. So he didn't think I was very funny. So I, I use that cautiously now. <clears throat> uh, so that's where we started with those mixes. And then at some point, uh, the lentil crunchers showed up about um, three o'clock in the morning, one morning in my head, one of those nights laying awake. Um, we had a lentil cruncher mix that, that you could make and, and bake the lentils in your oven. It honestly wasn't very good. And so we were discontinuing that anyway, um, but wondered if there was a different way to do that. We, we kept thinking about um, corn nuts. I don't know how many of you have had corn nuts, but thinking um, certainly there must be something that we could do with either the lentils or the wheat. We knew that wheat uh, was a, there was a puffed wheat product that um, a, a company just down the road from us in Big Sandy, actually Crackle and Kamut. Have any of you had that product? I have um, Bob Quinn. Yeah, yeah. Yep, and it's actually changed ownership now, but um, it's a crunchy wheat product. And so we knew that was being done. Um, and so we thought, well, maybe, maybe we can do that with the lentils. Um, so we started thinking about that. And, and immediately after that, actually, I went to a trade show where I connected with um, Thomas Stillworth, who manages that big Sandy Organics facility. And he said, well, why don't you bring those lentils over and we'll try processing them. Um, similar to the way we process the crackling kamut and let's see what happens. And we did that and um, we really had no idea what, what would come from that, um, but it has been, it's been a ride and the, the lentil crunchers have turned into for sure our flagship product. Um, they saw us through 100% growth last year and we're actually on track to see 100% growth again this year, which is um, pretty amazing to me. And we know that that's not a sustainable number, but we're going to take it and run with it as, as long as uh, long as we can. So, um, so that's um, that's kind of the history, uh, how how things happened, how they came about, why why we even started with a value added ag um, project in the first place when there's 
all of you know, there's plenty to do on the farm always. Why did we think we needed to, to add something else to that? Um, but, but that's sort of where it came from. And, um, and we are achieving some of those goals. My son-in-law and daughter, um, my son-in-law works full-time on the farm with Terry now. And um, my daughter works part-time for me here in the plant. Um, our son is in college. He's learning a lot of really great things that we're hoping he, uh, he brings back and um, is ready to apply. He uh, is taking not only some production, but some um, things that will apply really here at the plant as well, and seems very interested in that. So we're excited about, um, about what's coming. So I'll just start um, with the growing with, I mean, with the process. Um, any questions so far? No? Yeah, I'm, okay. oh. oh, sorry. I was wondering, Shauna, um, so it sounds like your lentil crunchers are being made over um, in the big sandy area with the crackling commas. <laughs> Is that right? So, yeah, and I'll, I'll get to the, the whole nuts and bolts of that, but um, we take them over there and they actually cook them and then we bring them back to our facility um, to season and bag and ship from here. So it's a, it's a co-packing agreement that we have with them, which is actually really common in the industry. Um, and it really makes sense. They have um, the, the big equipment to, to do the heavy work. Um, and for us to repeat that investment um, just doesn't make a lot of sense. So, um, so we let them do that part and we do our part and it's working really well. So uh, we grow, last year we grew about, um, 11, I want to say, Terry told me 11,000 bushels of lentils. That doesn't seem like that's what he told me. Keep in mind, he just broke 18 bones. So <laughs> not a hundred percent sure that's the right number. Um, anyway, we grow viceroys, small greens, and that's what we use in the mixes and for the lentil crunchers as well. Um, we chose those because we can grow them well. Um, because at the time that we started, there was a good market for the viceroys. Um, and also because they're small enough that they cook up really quickly. So, um, you know, if you think about mama coming home with the kids after work and needing to put a quick meal together, those viceroys don't take long at all. Um, really similar to, to pasta to get those cooked up and ready for a meal. So that was part of the reason we chose those. Um, we're using about 5% of our volume right now for our value added product. The rest is still being sold on the commodity market. Um, as we continue to grow, obviously we'll use more and more of our own lentils. And if we reach a point where we um, can't grow what we need for the value added project, uh, then we'll contract with other growers and you know, under some um, growing stipulations, make sure that they're doing things the way we do things. Uh, we'll talk about that as well. Um, but that's our plan going forward to be able to be sustainable and, and continue doing what we're doing. Uh, so once the lentils are harvested on our farm, then we take them um, to Columbia Green and Plentywood where they are cleaned, identity preserved for us. Um, so we know we're getting our own lentils back. That's important. Um, it's an important piece of the puzzle for us. A lot of our marketing is built around our tagline, which is our, um, our fields, your fork. So we really wanna make sure that those are um, our lentils or lentils that we have grown under contract, um, just to make sure that we're keeping things cohesive and, and um, following, following along, uh, walking the walk, I guess, um, doing what we, what we say that we're doing. So um, they get cleaned. We bring those back in 50 pound bags. And we store them here um, in our facility until they're ready to go to Big Sandy and get cooked. They go to Big Sandy, um, they get cooked there, and then we bring them back here um, to finish them up. And so then they go into our commercial kitchen where they get seasoned and bagged up, and then we um, case and ship everything from here. So it sounds like a project. Um, it is. These little guys have a lot of miles on them by the time they get put in a bag and, and sent to a retailer somewhere or shipped directly to the consumer from here. Um, but it it works. Um, it's still profitable. There's a lot of money in the middle. And, and so a lot of that money that would, uh, you know, normally go to some other processor somewhere, um, we're retaining those profits. That's what value added ag is all about. Um, we're used to traveling here, you know, it's, it's Northeast Montana, you know, much the same as, um, Northwest North Dakota. We, we travel a lot. We just know that, that we're going to put some miles on. And so, um, the back and forth, between Plentywood and, and Big Sandy is not really a big deal for us. There's always someone heading that direction and, and we can, and, you know, make things work. 
Um, we can also get freight lines into SCOBY. And so we're gonna be utilizing those a little more, especially back and forth um, between SCOBY and Big Sandy. We'll be utilizing the freight lines and, um, and moving things that way. Although there are some um, special things that we need to do because it is a food product and there's food safety component involved there. Um, so we'll need to be working that out as we move forward. So once we um, have the, the products here, um, like I said, or the, the crunchers back here, they're um, seasoned and packaged up and we send them out. So let me show you some of the products and we'll see how this works with my phone. Um, it might be a little bit of an adventure. Um, so our very first product that we came with actually was um, our sweet lentil chili mix. Can you see that? Awesome. Yeah, looking good. Yeah, and so um, on the back then of each of the packages it has nutrition information. Um, it has a list in orange there of, a, of ingredients that the consumer needs to pick up to be able to finish the recipe and then instructions on how to put it together. And, and it can, it's, it's versatile. You can use lots of different meats in it. I have a lot of people that use um, wild game in it. Elk is fantastic in it. So um, this was our initial product. And, and the reason we chose this was because Terry's mom actually in the seventies, they grew lentils. Um, they had a bunch of sacks of lentils left in the Quonset and um, they had been using them and, and making this, they actually called it lentil stew. That wasn't really a marketable name. So we changed it to a sweet lentil chili and, um, and we had a fantastic response to it. So that was our initial product. We participate in the made in Montana and grown in Montana programs. And so our products all um, carry those labels. And I believe in North Dakota, there's something similar. Um, can you help me out with that? Pride of Dakota. Pride of Dakota. Correct. Yeah. Um, and so they, um, they would have a similar program there to, to participate. So this was our flagship product. And the next one that came with. Go ahead. Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, so what was the process of like starting that initial product? So you had like a family recipe and did you have like the bags and the label or just sort of an evolving process of adding those pieces? Yeah, so it was, it, it, product. <laughs> it was yeah. really an evolving process. So um, we, looked for some bags. Our original, I wonder if I have one sitting right here. Do you mind if I wander around the plant a little bit? I might as well, right? Since I'm mobile. Yeah. Uh, originally, we'll do a facility tour here a little bit later, just for fun, since I can. Um, so originally we started in these um, basically just poly bags like this with a, a label that we put on. Um, and they worked in, in the beginning for a little while. They, they don't look super fantastic um, and they didn't sit on a shelf real well. They weren't super marketable. Um, and also you can probably, maybe you can even see, I can get really close here. This is kind of fun. Um, you can see that those lentils were oxidizing a little bit. So the color wasn't really great by the time the consumer got it. So this packaging actually has foil lining in it. The light doesn't get to it. So when they open it, um, the lentils look just like they should, the same color as they were mostly when they came off the combine, that pretty green. So we went to Uline. It was, um, I kind of did a search online and I talked to some other people in the industry. Uline has a lot of um, bagging products, um, labels. I really just did a lot of searching to find um, you know, using search terms on Google, like um, uh, commercial food packaging um, and found some, some things that would work. We worked with our county sanitarian to make sure that we were using packaging that um, would be FDA and um, approved, you know, for use with food products. Um, so, in, in the, so, so I'll talk a little bit about the building then and, and, and how that came along and, and then the packaging comes along with it. We actually started in this building where, where we are now, it was a restaurant at the time and we rented, it was a night or a nightclub. So we rented space in their kitchen during the day and I had a tote with wheels on it and I would roll my tote in with these packages that I had found online, the, um, the bags to package in and some labels that I had actually printed at home. Um, and our county sanitarian had come in and approved this process. And so I would, um, and I purchased the label, uh, a lot of the spices online um, 
did a lot of research there to, to find a company that I felt really fit with us. They were a, a very family oriented company as well. I was able to visit with them on the phone. Uh, obviously a lot of spices can't be sourced within Montana or sometimes even in the U S and so we wanted to be really careful about making sure those were a good quality product that had the same assurances behind them as, as we're, as we're giving to our, our lentils and the, the whole product. So we um, work with a company called spices Inc. So we would bring our spices in and I had everything stored in a tote and I would roll the tote out of the back room um, during the day to make mixes in the kitchen and set everything up. And then I'd have to box it all back up and put it in the tote and roll it to the back room to store while they um, had their, their um, meal time going on their nightclub going on at night. And then the next day I would do the same thing. And, and we did that just to get started to see if this was something um, we really wanted to continue to do to see if there was a demand for the product um, before we got really carried away. It didn't take very long um, for that to get really old and um, not very sustainable. So uh, we rented space in um, an old service station actually that, that hadn't been in use for a long time. Um, we, we rented the corner that used to be the office and the bathroom area and we renovated that. Um, we had to go in and put up um, the, the wall board that's required in a food facility. Um, all of the, the molding, um, the base cove along the floor, um, all of the things that come along um, with regulations for a food facility. We did all those things in that little um, corner of the gas station and, um, and operated out of there, I think, for almost a year. Grew our product line a little bit. Um, we added some things like this fudgy lentil brownie mix. If you can see that, it has brownies in it. Um, has has brownies in it has lentils in it so the lentils are in there they get cooked and folded into the brownie mix so it's almost like cooking with applesauce if any of you are familiar with that baking with applesauce you boil the lentils to the really mushy and then you fold them into the mix it's the only time you want your lentils boiled until they're really mushy um so we added to our product line at that time um we added a spicy lentil chicken salad and we added um, a couple of wheat products at the same time. We got through Christmas um, that year and we were ready to grow again. And so we purchased a building in town um, that used to be a restaurant, completely renovated that building, did the same process again, um, went in all new flooring, all new walls, all new base cove, um, <clears throat> worked with our county sanitarian to make sure um, that everything was set up the way that it needed to be. So we, um, we got We've gotten to be very good friends with our county sanitarian. <laughs> I think I have him on speed dial and he probably cringes when he sees my call come in and because he knows it's going to always be something else with that, that Farber Farms bunch. There's always something going on, um, but they have been really good to us. And so one piece of advice I would have if you're considering any kind of a value added ag endeavor that includes food, really make um make good friends of your county sanitarian, um, of your building people, your electrical, your plumbing. You're gonna rely on them more than you know. Um, also at your state level, whoever your food people are um, at the state level, make sure that you have a good working relationship with them. Uh, it'll be on the daily, really, that you're involved with those people and visiting with them about um, what's going on in your in your facility. So the, the the hard mechanics of what's happening, as well as the food development side of it. So um, that would be one one huge piece of advice I would have. So um, last no, let's see, November of 2019, um, we decided that we would expand a little more um, and that it would be great to have a restaurant to go along with our products. We could serve our products in the restaurant would be one more way to market them. Um, and the supper club, oddly enough, that we uh, originally started renting kitchen space in had come up for sale. So we purchased that. And um, like I said, that was November, 2019 and things went really well until March of 2020, when they stopped altogether. Um, so long story short, unfortunately, in April of 2020, we ended up having to close the restaurant. Um, COVID was not good to us. A really small community only supports uh, so many restaurants. 
Um, there were several of them struggling. We were struggling and we made the hard decision to close the restaurant because we had a plan B and some of those other restaurants didn't. And so we closed the restaurant and we moved from our small building into the building that we're in now. We uh, moved all the processing facilities over here. We um, remodeled the kitchen and, and uh, kind of revamped the whole building to serve our purpose. Um, it's not uh, traditional in any sense. Uh, if you think about a food processing facility, uh, it has um, some quirks to it. And there are some things that we uh, have had to just sort of make work. Um, but that's okay. It, it actually has made us be um, a little more creative. How are we for time wise? Really good. So I think we'll just do a really quick, if I can get this turned around, um, we'll do a really quick facility tour. Everybody okay with that? Sounds good. Awesome. Okay. So this is what was the dining room in our facility. Um, and so we made this the office space right here by the windows, um, added some, some desk space. Um, all of our orders come in via email or via our website. So uh, we have our website set up so that orders can come in. They come uh, directly either to myself or to my um, plant manager here. They all get printed out on one printer here. Um, so the orders come off of the printer and then they get packaged up here along this line. So we have um, box storage here. This is where all of our product storage is. So everything is in a, um, in a tub and labeled. We're actually right now working with the Montana um, Montana Manufacturing Extension Center, um, doing some lean manufacturing type of things so that we um, have our shelving lined up a little differently. Um, so we have better inventory control, sort of a, a, a work in progress. Um, but one of the things I've learned and one of the things I can certainly tell you is that it will always be a work in progress. Um, if you are someone who does not like to pivot uh, who does not like to <laughs> change ships midstream or um, be able to think on the fly, work on the fly, um, probably a value-added ag food project is not for you. <laughs> um, things have changed more than I thought they would. Part of that due to growth, obviously, um, which is great. Part of that due to some challenges that we've had, and that's okay as long as you're willing to work with those challenges. Uh, and make the changes that you need to make. So um, there again, this is our packaging, um, our, where we case things up and, and ship them out. That's our, our line there. Um, and we added a small employee break area. And so um, this is what used to be the bar area of the facility down in here. Um, there was a wall here, we took that wall out. This is actually where the bar was and there's a storage uh, the walking cooler is behind there so we made this our pre-entry area um, so when you come in from the the end of the building down here you come into this area um, scrub up this is where um, hair nets and, and gloves um, lab coats or, or scrubs get put on um, and do an initial scrub and then out of there into uh, you come out of here into the production area where there's another scrub. Um, and I thought we would be in production this morning. We're actually not. So I'm not gonna take you into that production area because it is, it's been cleaned. Um, and Amy doesn't want me in her kitchen <laughs> um, wandering around while it's clean and ready, ready to go. Um, in the production area, always um, shoes, shoe covers or plant shoes, always um, gloves, hair nets, either lab coats or scrubs to cover um, your street clothing. Um, and then if you were to come out of the production area for lunch or for a break or for whatever reason, that all comes off and then has to go um, back on new stuff when you go back into the production area. So there's quite a process um, that, that goes with that. When we were first starting, um, the rules aren't quite as stringent um, when, you, when you first get going and there are some cottage food laws, you can actually do some production under those cottage food laws. 
once you reach a certain point, um, you need to be following all of the rules, largely, um, largely for two reasons. I'm struggling a little here because somebody's knocking on the door. I'm ignoring them um, <laughs> for two reasons. Uh, obviously, because you want to be following the rules, but but the other reason for us to to really want to make sure we're doing things right is these products are going. We've actually shipped to all but four states now, um, and really wanted to make sure that that we're now they're coming in. So if I get really sidetracked, <laughs> uh, we wanted to really make sure that we're doing things right because these products are shipping all over the nation. And we certainly don't want to play a part in having contaminated food out there. Uh, and so that has been one of the challenges that we've run into is making sure that we can um, keep up with all of those food, food rules um, and that we can follow them and that we can make those pivots when we need to, as we grow. Um, I think it's Amy coming into the production area. So maybe we'll get to run back there um, to make sure that we have everything in, in line where it needs to there. So yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, with, what was that point that you hit that you needed like all that, the sanitation and compliance with food safety? Was that based on gross sales or like volume of sales? You know, it, sorry, I keep putting the phone right up by my ear. That's just what you want to see. Um, <laughs> it, it really was based on, it wasn't a gross sales thing. It was um, once we expanded our sales reach. So, um, and your county sanitarian will be a big help there um, in telling you at what point you, you need to be able to, to step up your game, so to speak. Um, but for us, it was really about, okay, um, it, actually from a monetary standpoint, we're not even to the point where we need to be doing some of the things that we're already doing. So some of, some of the rules, yes, are set by, uh, by your gross sales. And so some of the things that we're doing, we wouldn't need to be doing yet because we haven't hit that gross sales mark. But we recognize that these products are going all over the nation. And uh, we just felt like we needed to be doing a little better and, and making sure that this product that was going all over the nation was gonna be representative of, of what we want um, the, the food in the US to be representative, representative of. So we talk a lot about how in the US we have the safest, least expensive um, food supply in the world and, and we have the most of it. And we wanted to make sure that we were continuing to, to play our part in that so that people um, would recognize that even a small operation like we have um, can really help up and, and help supply those food systems in the US, which has become a huge topic lately, right? Food supplies um, and and food food chain breakdowns. And we wanna make sure we were not contributing to that, that we were playing a part in being a solution to that problem, if that makes sense. It's a long way to say that, but. <laughs> so, so once we got settled in this facility, um, there are still challenges, even, even once you think that you're, that you're where you wanna be, there are still challenges. So um, I'm just gonna blow my nose here quick, excuse me. Okay, it's really hard presenting like this. Have any of you ever done this presented virtually like this where you can't see faces, can't get a lot of feedback? So some of the challenges that we ran into once, once we got into this facility then were obviously it was a restaurant. It wasn't set up to do exactly uh, what we needed it to do. So uh, there, there was a little remodeling that went on. Um, the air system was something that had to be changed over. So um, in a commercial kitchen like we have, the air exchange, there can't be air exchange between the, like the office part of the, the kitchen, or I mean the office part of the facility and the production part of the facility in the kitchen where the food's actually being handled. So we had to close off the vents in the, in the kitchen, in the commercial part of where the food's actually being prepared. We had to close off those vents from the rest of the facility. That meant we had to have a different air exchange for, for heating and cooling in the kitchen. Um, so we had to have that done. I couldn't even list all of the little things um, that had to happen, some different, you know, electrical that needs to, to go on. Um, all of that being said, just to point out that 
when you get involved in a value added project like this, there are going to be things that you that you don't think of because you couldn't think of them until you're actually actually into it and doing it. So know that whatever investment you make, that whatever time you allot for what you're doing um, is going to probably be half of, of what you need, whether it's the time or, or the financial investment, um, just because there are a lot of pieces to a value-added food project puzzle, um, not to deter you from thinking about that, but there are a lot of pieces to it. So um, licensing, obviously, make sure you're staying in touch with, um, with your state <laughs> and, and making sure that you're getting all of the licensing pieces together. Um, I'm just trying to hit on some other things here that um, managing growth then has also been one of the things that um, I mean, we, we obviously had good things planned for our business, but, but we didn't know exactly what that was going to mean as, as far as um, what that growth would look like and, and how we were going to have to manage that. So, um, right, everything from ordering extra packaging. So, so right now, um, this packaging that we get um, used to come in. And, and of course there's been some things happen, a, a global pandemic that added a, an extra level of difficulty. So that packaging used to come in three to four days and now it takes three to four weeks. And at the same time, we're experiencing some pretty large growth. So it's um, trying to decide how, how much extra packaging do we order in because how much will we need three to four weeks from now or, or the three to four weeks after that. Um, and that obviously comes with managing some cash flow, then making sure that you have um, lines of credit that will match up with that. So that's one of the challenges. Obviously, growing the lentils is one of the challenges, right? Making sure um, that we have enough lentils to, to meet the growth that we're having. Um, and then you throw in things like a drought. So this year, we grew about 10% of the lentils that we, that we usually grow. Um, since we're only using about 5% of what we grow right, right now, um, we're gonna be okay. We're gonna probably be tight coming into next harvest, um, but that's something we're gonna have to manage forward for. Um, you know, luckily for us, once the lentils are in a 50 pound bag, we can um, keep those and store those for quite some time. Um, but that's one of the things we're gonna have to plan ahead for obviously is, is, um, as our volume gets bigger and bigger. Um, and that, that's where we may, hopefully, we would love to get to a position where we're contracting with other growers, having them grow under our standards um, for our product and providing them a premium for their lentils. So um, someone asked me, well, why, why can't you just go out and buy some more viceroys from someone? Um, two reasons. One, we want it to be our product. We really do. We want this to be our fields to your fork. That's the platform that we've built on. We do a lot of social media work around that. And incidentally, I'm going to say half of our sales right now probably are directly related to social media and the work that we've done there. Um, so, so that's, that's been a big deal for us. And, and we really want to maintain the integrity that, that we um, have built there and saying this, you know, these are our lentils, they come from our fields or ones that we've contracted. Um, the second thing there though, is we actually, we don't desiccate our lentils. Um, our and this is um, where the consumer sometimes will dictate how your product changes. Um, obviously there are, you know, you can choose to sell a product however you want to, and there's always going to be a market for that. But overwhelmingly our consumers were saying, um, we don't want those lentils to be desiccated. Now, <laughs> I, I, I know there's a lot of schools of thought there and we do continue to desiccate um, sometimes our regular commodity lentils, um, but the lentils that are going to go directly into these bagged products um, that go directly into our lentil crunchers are not desiccated. We swap those and then we come back and pick those up. So anyone that would be contract growing for us would need to follow those same, um, those same guidelines. So um, just those are some more of the challenges. So um, where are we now? And actually, before I go too far, I wanted to show you some of the lentil crunchers, just so you have an idea. So these are the small 
packages that they come in right now. Uh, and we just, and I know I'm getting up against my time, so I'll be quick here. We just introduced some new flavors. We have a sweet hickory. This is an eight ounce bag. Um, this is our dill pickle in an eight ounce bag. And then real soon, our small single serve packages are actually going to be a two ounce size. Those will be resealable as well. And all flavors will come in that resealable. That's also in direct response to our consumers. They said, hey, your single serve size, um, we don't always eat all of that in one serving. And then the bag falls open and we have little lentils all over everywhere. So could we do something um, different and put those in a, uh, a resealable container as well? So um, we were responsive to that and I'm scooping lentils onto a paper here. All right, let me get this switched around. So these are lentil crunchers. I don't know, can you see those? Yes, yep. Yeah, yeah. so they're just crunchy. I mean, they're just lentils, that's all. And then they're, um, they're actually boiled and fried and and then there's some other things that we do to them. It's a propri proprietary process. Um, but they end up just being this crunchy little snack. Um, you can throw them right in your mouth. You can um, put them in soups and salads. And um, they're actually really versatile. And people are coming up with some super creative ways to do them or to use them. Someone told us that they're going to be putting their dill pickle crunchers on uh, in their potato salad and on their deviled eggs. Um, and so that goes right back to, again, you know, our consumers actually sometimes knowing even better than us what, um, what, what a product is capable of and what it can do, which is why we want to be real responsive to them when we can. So where are we now? Uh, we just hired a new marketing firm using some VAPG funds that we received. Um, VAPG is a value-added producer grant. And if you are looking at doing a value-added food project from your farm, definitely look into those grant funds. Um, I'm going to say you probably, it, it's probably a bigger undertaking writing that grant and getting those funds um, than, than you'll want in the first year or maybe even two years. Um, there's a lot of money available there. It's a very needy program. And so you want to make sure you're ready to use that program before you dive into it. So this is your three for us with the lentil crunchers and, and, the, um, and the mixes. And so we finally went to that value added and we got some um, some money to make a full court marketing press. So, um, so we're going to be starting that. Actually, they just sent some information yesterday. So you'll see some new things coming out of Farber Farms. That's fun. Um, all settled in the new facility. We have a new flavor coming out in January. Um, I mentioned we're, we're on track to um, be 100% growth again this year, which is super exciting for us. Um, we have one full-time and we're just bringing on two part-time employees. Um, and it won't be very long. We'll have a second full-time employee um, as, as things start to grow. Um, my, I think I mentioned that my daughter and son-in-law are both involved in the operation. My son-in-law full-time on the farm and my daughter part-time here. My son will be working for us when he comes back. So um, a lot of the goals that we had for this, we've already achieved. Um, and we're just looking forward to some, some more growth, being able to employ some more people, being able to really play a big part in all, our small rural community by providing jobs, um, but also bringing income from outside of the community that can be invested in, in our town, in our schools, in our churches, in our um, swimming pools and, and, the, and those kind of things. So we're, we're proud of that, that we're able to bring income in from outside of our community. A um, couple pieces of, pieces of advice to leave you with if you're, um, if you're looking at a, a value-added ag project, particularly a food project, um, be prepared for that vision to change, um, for it to evolve, uh, for your consumer to shape that in certain ways. Um, be ready to pivot and, and be willing to pivot and make some of those changes. A few of those have been hard for me. I thought I had a, a real serious um, vision about what I wanted and, and things needed to change. And it was for the better. Um, as ag producers, I think sometimes it's easy to, to feel like we, you know, we've been doing this this way for a while and it's working. Why do we need, why do we need to do something different? Um, but that's really, we have learned the, the name of the game in production agriculture 
um, this whole process has changed how we do things on the farm, our, um, how our rotations work. Um, we're more aware of, of chemical usage. Um, so not only have we had to learn to make changes on the farm, but also in the commercial facility here. Um, but then also reach out to your resources. There are so many resources out there when you start talking about value-added agriculture, um, whether it's the um, extension offices, whether it's the Pride of Dakota or the Maine and Montana programs, um, there are federal resources out there. Uh, our Department of Ag here in Montana has been fantastic. They have been so supportive of us. They've put opportunities in front of us that we would have had no idea were, were even out there. Um, there are manufacturing extension centers. Um, just start looking, reaching out to those resources. Um, there are people out there who their, their whole job is to help you succeed and, and help you um, make, make a go of this project. So um, make sure that you're really utilizing those resources. <laughs>